I'm Ben Riley-Smith, the Daily Telegraph's political editor. Back in 2014, I was here in Scotland covering the Scottish independence referendum. Then the country voted decisively to stay in the UK by 55% to 45%. But now, seven years on, the independence debate is back at the top of the political agenda. For the next four days, I'll be crossing the country to try and get a sense of what's really happening on the ground. We'll go from here in Inverness to Skye, then south to Glasgow, across to Edinburgh, and end up at the Scottish borders. We'll be talking to politicians of all political stripes. Let's recognise it's right that Scotland can determine its own future. Then let's engage in having a meaningful debate about what the future is. And let's be honest about the challenges, about the opportunities that we face. You should never take the state of your country for granted. The people in power at the moment, there's a tremendous responsibility on their heads because it is they who will decide whether the union survives by either the failure to act or by doing the wrong things. What I really want to try to understand is why half the country say they support Scottish independence whether there really will be a second referendum, and if so, who'll win? Well, here we are in beautiful sky. The sun is shining, there's a nice breeze, and we're here to see a man called Ian Blackford. He's the SNP MP for the area, which was one of the few to vote for independence back in 2014. He's also the SNP's leader in Westminster, which means he's leading the charge in London to try and force the UK government to grant a second Scottish independence referendum. It's not bad, is it? Why don't I, why don't I show you around? That would be fantastic. Yeah. Now, here's a question. Imagine if I made you all powerful mm -hmm. and you could click your fingers and decide when the second referendum is held, when would you choose? The message that we've got from the people, I think in general, is that people understand that there will be a referendum, that the, there is a majority in Parliament for that. But there's also a message that people expect us to deal with the pandemic first, so let's do that. And from a position of safety, as we're discussing economic recovery, because here's the issue, if we're to deliver the economic recovery that we want to see, then the Parliament has to have the powers to deliver that. So in a timely manner, I, I don't want to put a, a date on it. I understand why for a lot of people that discussion on timing is important, I get that. But what I would say to everybody is that that discussion of what type of country is actually even more important because people will make their judgment as to whether or not they're in favour of independence, yes or no, to a large extent on how they see that aspiration of, of Scotland as an independent country. Right, that's you. You're done. There's a challenge for you guys right now because you believe you have a mandate for a second referendum, but how it worked last time was the UK Parliament and the UK government granted you the right to have a referendum. Right now, Boris Johnson is very clearly saying, no, not for now, and it's unclear whether he's ever gonna change that stance. So what are you guys gonna do if he keeps on saying no? I don't believe he will. I think he recognises that he can't deny democracy. I mean, we've just had a situation where the SNP have won this election in Scotland with 48% of the vote. It's not a good look for Boris Johnson to say, well, it's not good enough. Of course it's a mandate, and he recognises that he's going to have to come to the table and give that authority to the Scottish Parliament to call the referendum, to have that vote, that say in Scotland's future. It will happen. Let's say you're wrong, and when you talk to people around mm -hmm. Boris Johnson, they make pretty clear he's in no mood for granting a referendum anytime soon. Would you go ahead and hold a referendum unilaterally if the UK Parliament, the UK Government, doesn't grant you that right? But what the Scottish Parliament will do is pass a bill that will allow for a referendum to take place. We're seeking the consent of Westminster to do that. But let, let's wait and see what happens. I mean, the government, the UK government has indicated that they will not take the Scottish government to court. Let's see what happens if we end up going down that road. I hope we don't. I think it's far better if the two governments come together and we can reach agreement. But there's nothing in the, the legislation, I would argue, that precludes the Scottish Parliament seeking to uh, test the, the will of the people of Scotland as to whether they wish independence or not. That's not a wildcat or an illegal referendum. That's a, a government accepting the mandate that it has from the, from the people. Despite what some of my opponents say, I am a working crofter. <laughs> so here we are back on the mainland, 
just got the ferry across from Skye, and from here we're going to head due south to Glasgow. Who we're going to talk to you now are the foot soldiers, the supporters driving independence, and in particular a cohort who support independence more than any other, the under 30s. I think the reality is that for a lot of young people across the UK actually, but I think especially in Scotland, a lot of young people feel ignored by the status quo, they feel ignored by Westminster, we feel as though our voices are not being listened to. I mean, if you think back to the, to the EU referendum, the vast majority of, of young people voted to remain in the EU because we see our future as part of a bigger world. Like, for example, you know, with the European Union, we had policies like Erasmus, for example, which allowed young people to live, work and study across the, 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 the European Union. That was a fantastic opportunity. And for you know the divisive politics of Brexit to take that, that away from us, I think it's an absolutely crying shame. People my age, you know, we, we sort of grown up right in the middle of the 2008 economic crisis. I was in primary school when that happened and it hit my family hard. And, you know, the reaction to that was austerity and it meant that we grew up in approaching the referendum under austerity politics. And people in Scotland especially felt that, people across the UK felt that, but we had an opportunity to change that. And I think if you come from working class backgrounds especially, but if you come from a age group like ours where we've had economic crisis after economic crisis, we need to see a route out of that and independence, in my opinion, and a lot of young people's opinions offers an escape for that, you know, if we can take that opportunity to, to economically thrive in an independent country, it, it to me seems quite silly not to take that opportunity. Do you ever talk to your parents about independence? Because I'm curious where they stand, different generation, traditionally less support for independence with them. Where do they stand on all this? Well, my, my parents are traditionally Labour voters and they were like stronghold Labour voters right through my entire life, even though we didn't speak about politics. But at this election, I noticed that my dad had sort of came round and he's decided to vote for the SNP. I don't know that that means his stance on independence has changed, but it means that there is a change happening in the older generation. And I think that's what's really important in these discussions is it isn't about setting generations aside, it's about making sure that we can convince the majority of Scots that independence is the right thing. My parents as well were traditionally Labour voters. I mean, they did vote yes in 2014. I think my parents very much moved away from Labour, probably around about, you know, the kind of financial crisis, actually. It was around about that kind of time. You know, I think a lot of people in Scotland started to think, well, wait a minute here, you know, can we maybe do things better on our own? I mean, and I think that was a kind of question that a lot of people in Scotland started to ask themselves. The vast majority of people, regardless of age, and I think, you know, particularly older people as well, just want a better country. They want things to be better for, mm -hmm. for their kids, for, for their grandkids. One thing that really struck me from that conversation with Charlotte and John was their families, because it's an issue that lies at the heart of this debate. Both of their parents voted Labour, and yet for them it's SNP. And that's the story of this city, Glasgow. Decades ago, this was redder than red territory, heartland Labour. And yet now, it's the yellow of the SNP that dominates. It's the same for independence. This was the second city of the empire. The industrial work done here in Glasgow powered the British Empire. And yet in 2014, the city voted yes. And that's a challenge for unionists. How on earth did they win over left-leaning Scots? They're certainly not going to vote for the Tories. And for many of them, Labour is a tarnished brand in their eyes. To understand that more, one man should be able to help. Gordon Brown. How concerned are you about where we are right now and the strength of the UK? I mean, do you think there's been a more perilous point for the union in your lifetime than now? No, of course not. I mean, because we have opinion polls that are registering support for independence. We've got a party that wants independence that's running the Scottish government, all because of mistakes that have been made by either one or two of the unionist parties. And so the union is, is, is in difficulty. But it will require statesmanship and leadership to be able to sort out the problems that exist and to understand that there's no one silver bullet. You see, if the UK wants to work with Scotland and wants the United Kingdom to work as, a, as, as an entity, then there's got to be an effort on, part of, on the part of the UK government to offer that hand of cooperation. And I feel that uh, this is something that is missing in the armory of the UK government. And when they talk about muscular unionism, what they mean is actually bypassing the Scottish government, putting up flags in Scotland to emphasise the importance of uh, Britishness. What they also would do is build roads and label them British roads, not Scottish roads. And that just won't work. And part of the reform package that you've argued for is 
about the House of Lords, actually scrapping the House of Lords in its current form, replacing it with a more regional assembly. Can you talk me through that idea and how quickly would you want to see that adopted? So a second chamber in, in any country has got to have a purpose. The House of Lords defends itself as a revising chamber, but it's completely unrepresentative of the public. And it's got worse in the last 10 years. So what is the purpose of a second chamber? I think one of the purposes of a second chamber is when you've got a multinational state, which is Britain, you know, Scotland, Wales, England, Northern Ireland, you can have a House of Lords that is representative of the different parts of the kingdom and also the English regions, which, you know, Manchester, Liverpool, Newcastle, they all want a voice. Now, this question of a second referendum looms over this whole debate. Boris Johnson's position is basically no, not now. How tenable do you think that position is? And do you think you can keep saying no for years to a second they, they've referendum? Got, they've got to get round a table at some point and try to sort this out. That's what had to happen in 2014. And, uh, you know, at some point they will have to, to look at uh, each proposal that's coming from within Scotland and from outside Scotland. So you know, it, it, it's going to end up with some uh, discussion between the, the parties concerned and that's probably the best way it can go. That's interesting. What discussion in what sense do you think Downing Street should consider holding a second referendum? I'm saying that you cannot sort out this problem, which is a constitutional crisis that is going to emerge next year when the SNP will push the case for a referendum. You cannot sort it out either in the courts or, or simply by saying we're not even going to discuss it. You've got to discuss it. Come to Edinburgh to get the thoughts of my friend and colleague, Alan Cochrane. We covered the 2014 referendum together. How different does it feel now to back then? Well, funnily, I'm actually less worried about the outcome this time. Although there are two big issues that have occurred since you were last year. Both start with B. One's called Boris and one's called, the other one's called Brexit. Neither of which are particularly good news for Scotland. But what is to me, as a unionist, good news is that nationalists haven't refined, refined their policies at all. They still haven't got a proper economic policy. They still don't know what the country is going to be as a, a long-term bet. And things like the border, whether you should have been stopped coming north you know, and shown a passport, I would have made you, by the way. But th things like that haven't changed since you were last year. And it's, it's nuts, because they lost last time, you'll remember, principally because of the economic policy that they didn't have. And they still don't have it. What about the first one of those then, Boris? Why is he so unpopular here, according to the polls? Well, it, it's not just because he's an Etonian, because, I mean, Cameron was a, a, a Etonian as well. And it, it's, I think it's his reputation for being a sort of blusterer and a sort of buffoon, and he's stupid antics and it's strange because Scott's like a character and he's certainly got that, he's certainly got a character. He's got to care about the union as everyone, I mean it's the same with David Cameron, say with if it, if it was a Labour Prime Minister. No British Prime Minister of any shape wants to be the one who allows the union of United Kingdom to break up. It's a huge issue for him and I'm glad he's taking it seriously. He is taking it seriously, <laughs> he just doesn't come here, which is probably wise. <laughs> How pessimistic are you about the state of the union? Because when you talk to some people in London, some of them privately say, we think it's pretty much lost in the long term. No, this is, drives me nuts, this. The English have given up on the union quicker than, than they need to. So you don't think in five, ten years the union's going to be over? No, I don't, no. But we've got to sort out the constitutional problem. But I think the way to sort it is let weather on the vine. She's not going to push it very hard. He's taken, he's taken a step back. What we don't want is the whole of the English media world and the, the opinion farmers to start saying, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a busted flush. We don't want any more of it. Just l leave it alone. And for goodness sake, don't give the Scottish Parliament any more powers. In the short term, the front line of the battle for independence is this building behind me, the Scottish Parliament. When it was created in the late 1990s, supporters of devolution argued it would kill off calls for separation. In fact, the opposite happened, and this was the route for the SNP to get a foothold on raw political power. Back in May at the Scottish elections, the SNP were hoping to get an overall majority. In fact, they missed out by just a single seat. That seat was won by the Scottish Labour deputy leader, Jackie Bailey. 
Yours was the seat ultimately that denied the SNP their majority. How significant do you think that is in the independence debate and where we are? Well, that made it a particularly sweet moment, I have to say. And, and it was the same in 2016 um, when the result for Dumbarton came through and I won by that slim majority of 109. We denied the SNP a majority then. My constituents have continued to deny the SNP a majority. And I think that is important in the context of the proposed referendum that the SNP want to hold. If you take the wider view, scroll back 15 years, Scotland was Labour territory. Now you're the third party, according to seats. What do you think needs to be done to get back up to being the top party in Scotland? How do you reconnect with those left-leaning voters again? Well, I think what was interesting is in that period, you know, voters didn't want to speak to us. We had no permission to be heard. The one thing that was really different about this election is I think we've regained permission to be heard. The SNP are pretty clear on their reading of the election. They believe they have a mandate for a second referendum. What can Scottish Labour do in this place to try and stop that? Well, let, let me challenge that notion from, from the beginning, because to be frank with you, they started off talking about an independence referendum because that's what their own members wanted to hear. But during the course of the campaign, you know, it disappeared from their leaflets. They didn't talk about it in television studios. You know, and when asked the direct question, I forget which television interviewer asked him, uh, asked the First Minister that, you know, if somebody didn't want independence, but they wanted recovery, who should they vote for? And her response was that they should vote for Nicola Stone. At the end of the day, you cannot ride both horses. You have to put the, independ the independence question to one side and the recovery of the country first. Travelling around Scotland this week, it actually makes me realise how different today is to 2014. Back then, the Scottish independence movement had a mountain to climb, to be honest. Yes, they had their referendum, but throughout that campaign, they were way behind in the polls until the very end. And I remember when you talked to most pro-UK politicians or campaigns privately, they were pretty confident they were going to win. But today the landscape has totally changed. For most of the last year, the yes side has actually been ahead. And there is a feeling on both sides that if there was another referendum, it would be eminently possible for independence to happen. The question though, is whether the UK will grant the SNP that referendum. I got the chance to put that to the man in charge of union policy for the UK government. Ian Blackford, the SNP Westminster leader, when I talked to him, said eventually Boris Johnson will agree a second referendum. It's only a matter of time. Can you imagine any circumstance that he would agree a second referendum before the next election in 2024? I don't think so. I mean, Ian's a lovely chap and a good friend. Ian enjoys being in Westminster so much, I suspect that he'd probably you know, he probably wouldn't want a referendum any time soon either. I mean, you know, he's he's a lovely part of the, the Westminster furniture. But more broadly, no, I mean, you know, Boris is completely focused, the Prime Minister is completely focused on making sure that for the lifetime of this Parliament, we increase economic opportunity, we provide people with the chance to make more of their lives, to take control of their futures. And that's quite rightly what the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom's focus should be. Um, I think it's, it's foolish to talk about a referendum now. We're recovering from COVID. We are still uh, dealing with the health uh, challenges that the COVID crisis has generated. And it seems to me to be at best reckless, at, um, at worst folly, to try to move the conversation on to constitutional division when people expect us to be working together in order to deal with these challenges. So that is pretty clear. Your position is there will be no referendum before the 2024 election. I can't see it. Boris Johnson, is he a help or hindrance in keeping the union intact? A help. Um, one of the things that I think people consistently underestimate is the degree of connection, personal and emotional, that um, the people across the country have with the Prime Minister. I think there's a, a myth that has been built up, fed by uh, Scottish nationalists, that somehow the Prime Minister doesn't go down well in Scotland. In my experience, you know, I've seen folk in Orkney, folk in Aberdeenshire, responding as warmly to the Prime Minister as people in Oxfordshire or Hartlepool. So, you know, I think it's an SNP mind game, as it were, to try to suggest that somehow the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom shouldn't set foot in part of the United Kingdom. Would you want to see him up in Scotland more regularly? I think he's only been a couple of times in the last six months. Yes. One of the things about COVID has been that the Prime Minister's desire to be out and about uh, has been constrained. The Prime Minister wants to be and should be 
visible, active, uh, and engaged in every part of the United Kingdom. And I think that he is, he's not just an asset for the Conservative Party, he's an asset for the country. So my own view would be, obviously it's for the Prime Minister to decide how he spends his time, but the more time the Prime Minister spends in Scotland, the better. Reforms, there's a lot of talk about whether there should be wider constitutional reforms, yes. including from Gordon Brown. Do you think there's any merit in trying to replace the House of Lords with a more regional elective system? The thing about House of Lords reform is that it can consume an enormous amount of time for not always a huge amount of uh, benefit. You know, I'm open-minded about ideas for constitutional reform in the future, but it's not a priority for me now. To my mind, one of the most important things is A, we already have powers which have been devolved to all of the constituent assemblies of parliaments of the United Kingdom. Let's make sure that those are used effectively. And secondly, we have a local government which we should be concentrating on strengthening as well. So, you know, one of the things that, I, that I'd like to do is to work with the Scottish Government to strengthen local government in Scotland so that Aberdeen, the Highlands, the Borders and others can do more, just as we're doing through levelling up in England, in order to strengthen the voice of local government there. When you look at the map of recent Scottish elections, it is a sea of SNP yellow, but right at the bottom there is a strip of Tory blue. And that's why we've come to the borders today, to try and understand how the Conservatives have got a foothold in this area and what it means for the Scottish independence debate. And to do that, we're talking to a Tory duo, father and son, David and Oliver Mundell, who both represent this constituency. Give us a sense for the borders and the people here and whether they feel fully Scottish, English, a bit of both. What's the feeling here? Well, I think people do feel that living here, they're part of a, you know, a, a unique uh, area in the United Kingdom. In historic times, the border did actually move you know, back and, and forward. People who live on the Scottish side, born on the Scottish side, do feel you know, very Scottish, but they, they recognise their connections to the north of England. So many people that live here are working in Carlisle, uh, they're travelling there for leisure, uh, medical uh, reasons. Now, if the SNP had their way and Scotland becomes independent, that would be the front line between two separate countries. What impact do you think that would have here in this area? I think it'd be an absolute disaster. I think we see the world over. Uh, border regions don't do well economically. They tend to uh, see economic activity move away in, in both directions. You see that even uh, within uh, the EU, between uh, France and Germany, uh, border communities uh, struggle even between major economies. You know, there have been detailed studies done that show that, that people don't set up businesses and create jobs round about the border despite what some in the SNP have, have tried to claim uh, recently. David, what do you think the unanswered questions about what independence would look like are the ones that the SNP need to answer? At the start, it's the basic economic questions. It's the question about what currency we, we would use. What would you get in your pay packet? Uh, what would be in your uh, bank account? That is such a fundamental question. I mean, I think there is a big question around the EU because the, the Scottish Government uh, and SNP claim that this would be such an easy process to go back into the EU. And obviously some people who were Remain uh, supporters are, are, you know, are, are uh, um, inclined towards that, that argument. But there isn't a shred of evidence to suggest that Scotland could go back into the uh, EU. You were in David Cameron and Theresa May's cabinet as Scottish Secretary. Looking down at Westminster, are there things you think the UK government should be doing more of to try and bind the UK together? I think that one of the things that, that, that's recognised is effectively the Scottish government is a campaign organisation. So every day, in every way, independence is promoted through that mechanism. You know, and independence is the answer to everything. If we asked, a, you know, if we asked a question about a pothole on this road, it's because of UK government austerity and if Scotland was independent, there'd be no potholes. Now, I think the UK government has to be much more a campaign organisation for the United Kingdom, and that has to be in the DNA of government, in the DNA uh, of, of Whitehall. What a journey it's been, more than 600 miles driven. We've ended up here at the border, at the River Sark. And this small stretch of water behind me is all that separates the English and the Scottish border. 
So what have we learned on the journey? Well, I think there are a couple of firm conclusions you can draw. Well, firstly, there will not be a second referendum anytime soon. The UK government won't grant it, and the SNP aren't really ready to push for it because of the pandemic. And even when they do, which would probably be 2022 rather than 2021, there are all these knotty questions about legality and legitimacy that aren't going to be solved quickly. And secondly, there are huge unanswered questions in what an independent Scotland would actually look like. Currently, the SNP have a wish list that hasn't really been tested. If we did get to the points of another independence vote, they would have to have clear, concise answers. But that shouldn't give too much solace to the UK side, because there are problems there too. One of them is in who can carry this message. Boris Johnson is treated with disdain by a lot of Scots. Gordon Brown and Alistair Darling haven't been in frontline politics for a decade. Ruth Davidson is moving down south, and the young Scottish Tory and Labour leaders have only been in the job for less than 18 months. Most people I've talked to up here think Nicola Sturgeon and the SNP are outgunning the UK side in communications. Also, no one should underestimate the disillusionment and detachment that a lot of Scots feel towards the Union, especially among those younger generations. In the end, if there is another independence vote, it will probably come down to that old question of heart versus head. For me, I think the biggest takeaway of this trip is just how close the Union is to breaking point, closer than at any point in any of our lives. And for Westminster, that should be a real point of reflection. What can they do to bring the union back together? Is it Gordon Brown's constitutional reforms, or is it a more front-footed approach to singing the benefits of the union? Whatever it is, one thing is crystal clear. Anyone who thinks the cracks of the union will simply heal by themselves needs to think again.